John the fourth chapter, we're going to read today the first 15 verses. I know it seems like a lot, but it really isn't as long as it might appear. Thank you. You might can tell if you're able to hear me breathe. Uh, I tell you folks, I have some of the worst allergies down here in Texas ever since I come back to Texas. And I struggle with them winter, summer, spring, and fall. Just all year long, I struggle with them. Amen. <laughs> John chapter 4, the first 15 verses, if you'll join me today. I'll put the passage on the screen for those in the building this afternoon. The King James text today reads, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither Come hither to draw. Amen. Let's go to the Lord today once again. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Lord that we feel in the house of God today. We thank you, Master, for the Word of God. For the Word of God is to the believer bread, it is sustenance. It is the means by which we obtain and increase our faith. Master, today help 
this preacher to deliver the message that you've given me for your church. Help me to do it in a manner, O oh God, that will allow it to be received by the hearer. Let this seed today, O oh God, fall upon good ground. Let the Spirit go before me. Till up that fallow ground. Pull up the stones and the stumps that would prevent the seed from finding good soil and being able to take root and grow. Oh, Master, today let us receive the Word of God with gladness. And let it bring forth fruit unto righteousness in our lives. We ask it all in the precious saving name, Jesus. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. I want to talk to us for a while on the topic today. Eight glasses a day. Now before I go any further, I want to say hello to Camille and to Brady, my buddies up there in Kansas. I promised them I would say hello and I don't want to forget. Amen. Hi guys. Water today is the most essential element to human existence, to any existence of any biological being for that matter. As scientists search the cosmos for signs of life, they first look for evidence that water exists or that water at least has existed somewhere on the planet they are exploring. About 71% of the Earth's surface is water covered and the oceans hold about 96.5% of all Earth's water. Water also exists in the air as vapor. It exists in rivers and in lakes and ice caps and in glaciers. In the ground as soil moisture and as well in aquifers, aquifers, and even in you and I today, in our dogs and our cats. In adult men, about 60% of their bodies are water. However, fat tissue does not have as much water as lean tissue. In adult women, Fat makes up more of the body than men. I'm sorry, ladies, this is according to my research. <laughs> Fat makes up more of the body uh, for women than men, so they have about 55% of their bodies made of water. Water serves many functions and many purposes in the human body. Here are just a few of the examples of the ways that water works in your body. It helps to regulate body temperature. It moistens tissues in the eyes, the nose, and mouth. It protects body organs and tissues. It carries nutrients and oxygen to your cells. It lubricates joints and it lessens the burden on our kidneys and liver by flushing out waste products. Without water, it is impossible for a human being to survive. According to one study, you cannot survive for more than 8 to 21 days without food and water. Individuals on their deathbeds who use little energy may only last a few days or weeks without food or water. Water is far more important to the human body than food. With water only but no food, survival may extend up to two or three months. Thus, we can see just how important the Word of God is today to the believer. Hallelujah. It is our lifeblood. It gives blood mobility, thus allowing it to carry 
nutrients and oxygen to our various body parts and organs. I meant to say we can see how important water is, not the Word of God, is to our bodies. It gives our blood mobility and it helps to carry nutrients and oxygen to various parts of our body. Water purifies us. As it passes through our bodies and is filtered through our liver, toxins and those things which might be harmful or even fatal to us are then carried by water out of our bodies. In our primary text today, the Lord is sitting by the well of Jacob and he is in need of water. Water is so important. You cannot survive without water. Here comes this Samaritan woman to get her uh, daily supply of water. Can you imagine living in an environment where you have to walk heaven only knows how far to get to a well so you can fill up a container with water to bring it back to the house and that's all the water basically you're going to have to work with for the rest of the day. Can you imagine? It's sad to know that there are still communities in our world, there are still people on our planet today who live like this. They don't have running water inside the house. But water is so essential to our existence. And in the course of his conversation with this woman, the Lord makes it known to her that he has a supply of water that unlike the water which irrigates the human body and provides for biological existence, he has access to a water that once it is consumed, it becomes within us a well unto itself. Oh, hallelujah. Can you imagine how wonderful would it be if all we had to do was drink a glass of water and that water within us became a source of water. That water within us became a well. And water was constantly being produced and constantly being provided from within. So never again do we have to go to an external source to get our water. Most of us have been raised and we've heard the saying that if you're going to live a healthy life, if you are going to keep your body in peak condition, it's recommended that you drink eight glasses of water a day. My goodness. As human beings, as biological creatures, we are constantly over and over and over and over again having to introduce water to our bodies. Some of us don't much care for straight up water, so we like ours mixed with a little tea bag, or we like ours mixed with a little bit of Pepsi syrup, or a little bit of Dr. Pepper syrup, you know, and maybe even carbonated a little bit, but we're constantly having to find a source. We're constantly having to provide for our bodies because every time we turn around, we find that once again, we're thirsty. Our bodies are indicating to us once again that our water level is low and we're beginning to dehydrate. Am I telling the truth? Uh-huh. Hallelujah. 
and it over and over again perpetually produces water from within us. So much water, in fact, that we have more than we can use. Hallelujah. The Bible declaring out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. Glory to God. There is more water produced by the life spring water that Jesus Christ promised this woman at the well than we can ever possibly use. And we wind up with more to spare and more to share. Hallelujah. In John chapter 6 verses 58 through 63, Jesus declared, This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things saith he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples when they had heard this said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. This little woman at the well also misunderstood the Lord. She thought he was speaking of natural water. She thought he was speaking of that water which satisfies the daily thirst. But he was speaking to her not of natural water but of spiritual water. Listen, those who try to turn the concept for instance, of eating and drinking the elements represented in the Lord's Supper into literal physical elements through such doctrines as the Roman doctrine of transubstantiation. Those who do this are entirely missing the point. They are carnal and they are worldly in their understanding. They are not spiritual they failed to understand what the Lord was articulating. That which he was speaking was spiritual and not literal. He was not inviting us to engage in cannibalism, but rather welcoming us to the table where he is able to impart himself to our souls, hallelujah, thus providing life and sustenance to our spiritual man so that we might live forever. In John chapter 7 verses 37 to 39, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scriptures hath said. So he's referring now to something that was said and written in the Old Testament, okay? He said, he that believeth on me, as the Old Testament has articulated, listen, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Your body is mostly made of water. It has many ways of losing water. And yet it has no way to generate 
water. We can sweat. We can urinate. There are many ways our body can expel water, but there is nothing within us that produces water. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is God's way of introducing water, listen, to our soul. But the water that our God gives us is not expelled and never evaporates. Hallelujah. It is self-sustaining. It is self-replenishing. Glory to God. Like our God himself, it is self-existent. Hallelujah. The very name Jehovah, meaning the self-existent one. Glory to God. So when God puts his spirit within us, that spirit is identified as water. Hallelujah. It's our source of life. It's the means by which nutrients are carried to various parts of our body. It's the means by which oxygen is carried to our souls. It's the means by which that which is toxic and lethal is expelled from us. Hallelujah. you and expel them so that you can live eternally hallelujah oh I'm going to tell you I don't know how many times I can thank God for helping me to expel anger yes. to expel frustration to expel envy to expel all these negative worldly carnal things that the enemy would try to bring into our life. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, he holds it up like an apple and wants us to bite the apple. And all too often we do. Hello now. All too often we entertain those negative things. We entertain the works of the flesh for just a while. But then thank God after a period of time the Spirit of the Lord comes and helps us to expel that negativity, to expel that wickedness, to release it from our soul, hallelujah, so that once again we're healthy and we're pure and we're clean and we're holy before our God. Hmm. I'm going to tell you a lot of people, I didn't grow up in the South. I didn't grow up around a church where folks shouted and danced in the aisles. Unfortunately, my church, we had a marvelous move of God when I was a kid, but it was very different than the way things uh, happened in the South. And uh, I understood, I heard that before I was born, a lot of the things that went on in the Southern Church also went on in the Northern Church. But the church I grew up in had already started dying before I was ever born. So by the time I come along, even though we had a wonderful move of God, it wasn't anywhere near what it had been, even years before that. When I came to Texas and I began to attend the Riverside Church of God, Riverside Church of God was a throwback. I'm telling you, oh, it was an old-timey Pentecostal church. Man, I mean, I mean, today, these people, man, they didn't sit there and say, well, I believe in Jesus, yes, now let me go out and work, and let me go make my money, let me go do this, let me go do that, let me have all these other interests and all these other priorities. Uh -uh. No, Riverside Church of God was full of a bunch of high hair, long sleeve, holiness women and godly men who loved the Lord with everything that was in them. See, I don't criticize a lot of people in the holiness movement because you got two kinds of people in that movement. You got people who do it in order to conform to the movement, and you've got those who do it because they honestly love the Lord, and they believe that these things please God. I find no fault whatsoever in people who want to do something because they love the Lord. Hey, if you're willing to live your life, woman, without putting scissors to your hair because you love the Lord and you feel like that pleases Him, then God bless you. I have no problem with that. I'm 
I'm going to tell you, Riverside was full of old time saints. And oh, honey, when they came to worship, my God, have mercy. They come into the house of God to worship the Lord. And they understood what Jesus said when he said, he said, God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what he's looking for. That's the kind of worship he seeks. By the way, he said those words to this same woman at the well. He said, God seeks people who worship Him from a deeper place. He doesn't want your worship to originate in your head. He doesn't want your worship to originate in your tongue. He doesn't want your worship to originate in your mouth. He doesn't even want your worship to originate in your heart. No, no, no. He wants it to come from a deeper place. He wants your worship to come from your spirit. So the old time Pentecostal people, when they come into the house of God to worship, they start out with praise. You know what praise says? Praise is man's efforts at worship. Praise, you see, you can heap praise upon your favorite performer. You can heap praise upon your favorite musician. You know, you can go to a Mariah concert, a uh, Mariah Carey concert, and you can heap praise upon her. Woo! Shouting and clapping and screaming and hollering. Oh, you're praising her, is what you're doing. That's praise. But God wants more. Than praise. But you see, there's a transaction that transpires in the Spirit of God's people. The Holy Ghost helps us as we're praising the Lord. He helps us to kind of step out of ourselves, so to speak, and get into a deeply spiritual place, a spiritual mindset, where all of a sudden, it's as though we're standing before the throne of God, and we're looking up into His face, and I'm going to tell you, the human body, <laughs> the human body has a hard time digesting such revelation. The human body has a hard time dealing with access and exposure to such power. When somebody grabs hold of an electric wire, it's amazing the things that their body will do. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> Right? Am I telling that? Why? It's because they've grabbed hold of power. It's not power their body is designed to handle. Your body hasn't been made in such a way so that you can grab hold of an electric wire. Am I telling the truth? I got news for you, honey. When God's Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, fire baptized people begin to praise the Lord and all of a sudden their praise is transformed into worship as they step out of the flesh and they step into their spiritual man and they begin to worship him from their spiritual man all of a sudden you see them just starting to dance all of a sudden you see them starting to run the aisles all of a sudden you see them leaping all of a sudden you'll see them just doing all kind of things because it's like grabbing hold of an electric wire and you don't hardly know what to do with it People say, oh, that's foolishness, that's the devil, that's craziness, nowhere in the Word of God is such a thing ever described. Really? That's funny because in my Bible, on the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. when the Holy Ghost came down, my Bible tells me that those who were in the city of Jerusalem perceived that the apostles and the 120 who were in the upper room were drunk. 
if all they were doing was speaking other languages and preaching in a variety of languages, why on earth would you think they were drunk? Now, I've seen drunks. I've seen drunks stagger. I've seen drunks fall. I've seen drunks pass out. I've seen drums dance and sing and act all kind of ways. Sometimes, God bless their soul, we'll be driving down the road and some of these poor folks are homeless, you know, and they're under the influence of something and you'll see them just doing all kind of things. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, because they're under the influence of something. I got news for you, honey. When God's people get in the Spirit, and they're under the influence of the Holy Ghost, all kind of things happen. <laughs> you might look at them if you're observing them and you don't know any better. You might look at them and think they're drunk. You might think they're plastered. You might think they're high. You might think they're on dope. Come on now. You know... The Word of God does tell us. I could go through a whole bunch of examples, for instance, of where people uh, got in the Spirit because in the flesh there are certain things God can't show you. There are certain things you cannot see in the flesh. God said, you cannot look upon me in the flesh. If you looked upon me in the flesh, you would die. There are examples in Scripture more than one where people were drawn away in the Spirit and God revealed Himself to that person and what happened to their body? The Bible said it fell as if it were dead. Their human body just falls. Growing up as a kid in the Pentecostal church in New England, before Benny Hinn was a big thing, matter of fact, Benny Hinn wasn't even known of back then, literally. I saw services in our church growing up as a kid where the Spirit of the Lord was falling. I mean, the power of God was sweeping through that sanctuary. We only had a hundred people, a hundred. We didn't have a big, huge church, you know. But the Spirit of God would begin to fall like rain in that building. And all of a sudden, one after another, people in the congregation begin to fall straight on their back like trees. Boom, 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 one after another another after another after another after another not a one of them had their eyes open not a one of them saw the other one fall they were all worshiping God and worshiping the Lord and getting in the spirit and all of a sudden poof there they went I saw this happen to my own blessed saint of a great grandmother one time We had a little church building. We didn't have a huge church building. She's at the front of the church. All of a sudden, my grandma and I loved my grandma. I adored my grandma. She began to fall and it scared me. I was afraid she's going to get hurt. And I literally watched her. She began to fall. And her head was about maybe 18 inches from hitting the seat on the first pew at the front of the sanctuary. And I literally watched, literally watched with my own eyes, watched her feet come out of underneath her, and her body went like a feather under the pew. Her head was under the pew. When you're in the spirit, everything's different. <laughs> <laughs> All the rules change. God will take care of you. I tell, listen, if somebody's in the Spirit and they're slain in the Spirit, they're not going to get up with a concussion. If you get up with a concussion, honey, you were not in the Spirit. If you come up with a headache, you were not in the Spirit. Because if you were in the Spirit, God takes care of you. Trust me. Say, Pastor, why are you talking about all this? I'm trying to tell you today, folks. There have been times I went into church and I was hurting, I was bruised, I was wounded. I was going through a tribulation or a trial. I was going through some terrible experience. 
and the Spirit of God would begin to flow in the church service. And I would be praising the Lord because whether or not things are going well, He's worthy of praise. Hallelujah. And I was praising the Lord and all of a sudden, I found myself ushered by the presence of God, ushered by the Spirit of the Lord, into the Spirit, so to speak. That all I'm talking about, I'm not talking about anything mystical or magical. I'm literally just talking about if I could compare it to a mindset. Basically, that's what it amounts to. It's like a mindset. You get out of a fleshly mindset and you get into a spiritual mindset, so to speak, okay? And when I got into that spiritual mindset, all of a sudden, I didn't feel defeated. I didn't feel uh, like I was going through a struggle. Like I, All of a sudden, I felt like I was David and I just slain Goliath. And I felt empowered and I felt happy and I felt overflowing with joy and gladness. And I mean to tell you, something got a hold of me. And next thing you know, my body was dancing. <laughs> oh, I'm celebrating. I'm, I come in sad. I come in depressed. I came in down. Oh, but honey, I'm anything but right now because I got out of the flesh and I'm in the spirit. Hallelujah. I'm worshiping God in spirit and in truth. There are times you come into the house of God. You, I've come into church as a young person. And my God Almighty, I'd be under such a burden. I used to go through some awful bouts with depression. When I tell you I understand what clinical depression is when I tell you I understand what depression looks like believe me when I tell you I know what depression looks like and it's ugly it is a ditch that people who are in it cannot dig themselves out of it's a dark and dismal and dangerous place And I've come into the house of God under such a weight of depression and despondency and despair that I was clinging to life by a thread. And the Spirit of the Lord would begin to move. And I'd be praising Him because He's worthy to be praised. No matter how I feel, no matter what I'm going through, God is worthy to be praised. And I'd be praising Him. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord would touch me. And in a second, in a moment, in an instant, my depression and my despair and my despondency were all lifted. And all I felt was victory. All I felt was joy. All I felt was gladness. And I began to hoop and holler like I was at a football game. And my favorite quarterback just carried the winning touchdown over the line. Hallelujah. And I begin to let out with a whoop. Woo! Just shout and shout and shout. You go ahead and you poke fun. You go ahead and you don't understand these Pentecostal people. You go ahead and you find fault with Holy Ghost worship and Pentecostal worship and worship that's in the Spirit. You go ahead and have all the problem you want to have with it. Because, honey, it don't bother me no kind of way. Because I'm here to tell you today, you have no idea what that type of worship experience does for the person who experiences it. Say, Pastor, a few minutes ago you were talking about expelling toxins from your soul. That's what I'm talking about. When you see people starting to dance and people starting to shout and people starting to run the aisles and people manifesting uh, the, the touch of God on them, honey, guess what? They're whizzing out toxins. They're spewing out toxins. They're releasing those toxins. All that negativity, all that bitterness, all that anger, all that frustration, all that envy, all that strife, all that trouble in their marriage, all that trouble in their home with their 
children, all of their burden for their backslidden child, all of their burden for their drug addicted child, all of that all of a sudden is expelled from their body. And as it's being expelled, you're seeing the result. <laughs> you're seeing the result of all that garbage being purged from them by the water that is the Holy Ghost. That's what shouting is. That's what dancing is. That's what running the aisles is. That's why this old preacher, honey, preaches these things and tries to help people understand these things because a lot of Pentecostals today haven't seen these things happen in decades. Wouldn't know what it was if it did happen. And you know what, Tommy? There are people are running around toxic. Because they don't know how to let the Spirit, listen to me, flow through them. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Why does it flow out of you? It's easy because it has to carry the negativity. It has to carry the toxins. You don't want that staying in your body. So it flows out. And with it goes all the garbage. With it goes all the poison. With it goes all the negativity. Woo! Oh, I'm going to tell you, I know what I'm talking about. I've come home from too many good old-fashioned Holy Ghost church services having just shouted myself hoarse or just having danced myself uh, to the point I couldn't hardly move anymore. I've come home from too many services like that and sweetheart, all the crap and all the negativity and all the garbage that I carried into that service, I went home without. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I know good and well what I'm talking about. Thus today, my friend, listen to me, once we have taken a drink of the water of life, which is the Spirit of Almighty God, often referred to as the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, we never again have to take a drink, but rather, but rather that which we have taken in becomes a wellspring within us, and it flows out from us. But it never exhausts and it never ends. Hallelujah. The baptism or the infilling of the Holy Ghost was part of the message of the gospel before the Lord even appeared to humanity. It was foretold in the Old Testament and it was a primary element. Listen, a primary element of John the Baptist's message. Matthew 3.11, John preached, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mark chapter 1 verse 8, John declares, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 3 verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The Holy Ghost baptism is not some invisible transaction which simply takes place at the moment we believe and embrace the gospel. It is a spiritual transaction which occurs after we have embraced the gospel by faith. 
part of embracing the gospel is believing that God will then fulfill his promise to us by filling us with his spirit. In Acts 1, 4 through 8, the word of God said, And being assembled together with them, commanded them, this is Jesus, that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 6, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, meaning he found believers, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Sorry, Brother Baptist, you do not get the Holy Ghost when you believe. Paul said, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. The message that they had heard did not include the message of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, listen, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been baptized according to, yes, it matters how you're baptized. Yes, it matters what is spoken over you when you're baptized. They've been baptized according to John's baptism. Paul didn't say, well, that's all right. That's good enough. No, 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 no. The power is in the name. There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost they already had been baptized they were already believers they had been baptized according to John's baptism but you know what immediately upon hearing the full gospel they were baptized in Jesus name then listen the next verse. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse number 6, Acts 19. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Hallelujah. That's how we know you got the Holy Ghost. When you get the Holy Ghost, you will speak with another language. It is not scary. It is not mystical. It is not magical. It will feel as natural to you as talking in, in English. The only difference is it won't be English that you're talking because the source of your speech at that point becomes your spirit. It's not up here. 
Your spirit is speaking through you. Your spirit, not another spirit, your spirit is speaking through you. And when God breathes life into your spirit, how do we know your spirit is alive? Part of what God has done is he's made it so that when your spirit is expressing itself through you, you can know the difference. How do you know the difference? It's speaking a different language. You see what I'm saying? That way you know, oh, okay, this is the Spirit. This isn't my, my you know, praying in myself. This is me praying in the Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. <coughs> for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. See, I need water. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, this is Ananias coming in to Saul immediately after his conversion on the road to Damascus before Saul has changed his name and become what we know today as the Apostle Paul. Ananias comes in, puts his hands on him, saying, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. The infilling of the Holy Ghost is God's down payment toward our eventual transformation. One day we shall be like Him, He has promised. For the time being, while we exist in the flesh, we cannot be like Him, listen, but we can be in possession of Him. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God not and not of us. Why does God put His Spirit within us? So that everything, every miracle that God performs through us, He gets credit for. He didn't enable us somehow to do it. No, 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 no. He put, he, he put His Spirit within us so that we through Him can do these things. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So that the excellency might be of the power that which we possess. Jesus said, what? But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Paul said we possess this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this gift. We have the Holy Ghost within us. Why? That the excellency of the power might be of Him and not of us. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Amen. I'm almost done today. A couple more scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. What does earnest mean? It means a down payment. 
it means a first installment. It means uh, something you give to indicate that you have every intention of making good on this offer. Do you hear what I'm telling you? God gives us the earnest of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is God's down payment on our eventual transformation. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, the Word of God said, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So you see, it's a down payment on our eventual transformation. The day will come when we will live in that place where the water of life for the Spirit of Almighty God will flow like a river. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 4, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now listen to this verse. Two verses, verses 3 and 4, Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse. Oh, hallelujah. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Now listen to this, children. Those of you who don't understand the oneness of God. The throne of God and of the Lamb. Not the thrones of God and the Lamb. The throne of God and the Lamb. One throne is occupied by God and the Lamb. The word and in Greek can also be translated as even. And many times in the New Testament it is translated as even. For instance, there, there are instances where the Word of God says, God and our Father. Well, that makes it sound like we're talking about two separate individuals, God and our Father. But when we read that, of course, we know the writer means God as our Father, right? He is both God and our Father. He's speaking of the two titles, but he's making reference to one individual. Well, there are other times when the Word of God is translated as God even our Father. Do you see the difference? All of a sudden it makes a lot more sense. It doesn't even begin to imply a separation or a distinction. In this instance, it could read and should read, but the God, but the throne of God, even of the Lamb, shall be in it. You say, well, how do you know that's how it should read? Watch. It's called keeping in context. And his servants shall serve him. Well, wait a minute. You're talking about the throne of God and of the Lamb. Which one? His servants are going to say, God's servants are the Lamb's servants. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. Oh my goodness. Every reference to what's in that throne is singular. Hallelujah. Lastly today, Revelation 21, 5 through 7. And he that sat upon the throne, and he that sat upon the throne, and he that sat upon the throne, glory to God, singular, he, one, that sat upon the throne, said, Behold, I, 
they make all things new. And he, singular, said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, Who's talking? It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Where have you heard those words before? Oh, hallelujah. Where have you heard those words before? Coming out of the mouth of Jesus, honey. That's where you've heard those words before. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Glory. And what a way to end this message. Eight glasses a day. You know, you're not going to need eight glasses a day. We're going to have access to the water of life. And we're going to have free access to that water. But Revelation 21 verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all all things. Now who's speaking? Jesus is speaking. The Alpha and the Omega. He said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. <laughs> oh, praise the name of the Lord. It's not but one God, honey. And Jesus is His name. Amen. Glory to God. I repeat, Isaiah said His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the singular Mighty God, the singular Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, talking about the Messiah. And then at the end of the story, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, Jesus said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Glory to God. The everlasting Father, the mighty God. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Oh, right now, if we're going to live a healthy life, we need eight glasses a day. But I'm here to tell you today, folks, God has promised believers a spiritual water that never runs dry. And that hole in your heart, that emptiness, that loneliness, that despair, that longing for relationship with God, that longing for an understanding of things divine, will be satisfied not just today, not just for a while, but it will be satisfied forever because God will put His Spirit within you and it will become a source within you of water that springs up and flows out from you. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name Thank of the Lord. Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen.